Uh, Mike D., how are you? Great to have you as always, man. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Our pleasure, Mike. Um, let me start. I know you saw the news, uh, the most recent news here, that Sean Payton has tested positive for coronavirus. Um, how does that, if at all, impact the Saints as they go through this process of, of free agency or the start of it? Well, they weren't doing a lot of work at the facilities to begin with. Uh, they had sort of spread out. And so, um, you know, Sean's going to be quarantined for a while. He, he's doing better uh, from everything I've heard. Um, I'm sure. You know, listen, all of us, if you were in the area and were out and about in the Mardi Gras time, <laughs> that's going to be a connect the dots there yeah. uh, all across the board. Uh, last week, I saw Sean was out in Arkansas at Hot Springs at the racetrack there, and then he started feeling bad this Sunday. Uh, and he didn't have fever. Uh, and so it's sort of crazy. He didn't have a cough, didn't have the fever, but he just felt lousy. And uh, that's very similar to a friend of mine uh, who tested positive very early in this. And uh, he's from the Bayou but lives in the New Orleans area now. Uh, and, uh, you know, if money meant anything, you know, he would ne- he'd be the last one on the list to get it. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he got a few dollars. But that, that goes to show you, you know, when you get this, it's indiscriminate on how you get it. And, and he's convinced, too. Uh, we've talked over the uh, phone that, you know, he's convinced he got it most likely, you know, around Mardi Gras time. As he says, you know, uh, you know, they got people here. You have no idea where they're from. None. Yeah. You know, and, and you're mixed in the crowd with everybody and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and he, he called me to give me the warning. Do not leave that house. Do, do not leave that house. I've been with you. Do not leave that house uh, to get caught. And, uh, for me, you know, my situation, it, it, you know, and doing the book, it, it's I know what I'm doing a, a lot of the time. Uh, my mom is in a nursing facility, and, and I can't go see her, but I can I can go by the window and, and just wave to her. And, and she's got a little bit of cognizance, and, you know, she'll talk and say, well, come in. I'm like, no, you don't get it. I can't get in. Uh, God bless her, you know, 88 years old, but uh, – it, it's one of those type of things that man, I've met up with some people, you know, that they're visiting their relatives in a similar manner, you know, and they, they raise in all kind of hell, you know, why, I don't know why I can't get in. And my thing is, well, don't get too close to me. Yeah. You know, if you got that attitude, uh, you know, don't get too, too close to where I'm at. Uh, but Matt is just part of what Sean's the first of the NFL people to get it. But come on, you know, they're just really started testing. Uh, a lot of people in the United States with it, and he, he he'll be he won't be the first, and he won't be the last, yeah. and that sort of thing. So, how much it affects the draft process? I do know one thing: he got chalk in his hand, and with those early picks, <laughs> you can't convince me he don't that he's not the guy. Uh, and listen, they they can spread it to you any which way you want, and whoever wants to fling it can do it, but. <laughs> Dude, I got mountain front property behind my home, if you believe all that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know who's got some, some really powerful say in that organization. And Sean has expressed to me at least three times, this is the process the Saints go through, that Jeff Ireland, the scouting department, all the scouts, they get together and they set up a board and the rankings, board-wise, everything else, position-wise, and ratings board. They take that ratings, and him and Mickey get together, and what they do is they set up uh, their own board. In essence, they take that, and they, what they're looking for is need, uh, positional fit, uh, that, that sort of thing. And so they, they're taking the board from the scouting department, and him and Mickey are arranging it in their order. And Sean's told me that at least five times. Or that, that's how it's done. And even Mickey has brought it up to us that pretty much that's the, the process that they go along with. How much that gets rearranged, uh, you, know, I, you know, that's just a guess at this stage. Uh, but, you know, they haven't been at the facilities for a while now, ever since basically you were told, you know, not to congregate uh, in, in a crowd like that. And so, We'll just have to see how it goes. And Sean, you know, he's he's a little younger than me, not much younger, but he's 56, I think. And so, you know, he's in good shape, and he's feeling fine. And, you know, like most people who are going to get this, 
you're going to be fine with it, but you, you're going to have some issues. And they got some people even younger than him that have come up with it, uh, you know, in a much more disturbing manner. And, you know, you and I had this conversation kind of off air, but what we don't know about many people we deal with day to day is underlying health issues. Yeah. Things that we don't know, you know, God bless you, what you and your wife have had to go through with your son and, and seeing that, that's, you, but you understand what you have to deal with. When you walk up to somebody and they look relatively healthy and they tell you that they have these major heart issues or lung issues uh, and kidney issues, their immune system's been messed up, had you... You somewhat stunned at first, and how many people like that that we don't know, and if they get it, and what happens with them, and the gentleman who I spoke to who had it, he's had some some underlying health issues, and he thinks that it certainly uh, exacerbated the the problem that he's got with it. But uh, you know, this is just the start of of us walking on this ground now. And, and and I was for what the what the NFL did. I, I think to have the free agency period started, uh, I think it gave us a distraction when we needed it. It gave us something to kind of look forward to. Uh, you know, sports has always been our distraction in life, uh, even in times of war. And, and you know, many people today, I even heard the president say, you know, he's a wartime president today. It, it's it's different than fighting on the front, but it, it is what it is. That has been that way, and I can remember. This is, goes back to 9/11, uh, and I'm doing sports talk with Buddy Deliberto. And one of the things Buddy and I get together, you know, days after this, and you know, it's a shook nation at this point. Uh, you know, we, it's still the the after effects of being attacked on your own soil. And you know, one of the things he said, "Hey, listen, I'm I'm, I'm going to be honest with you." let's be a comforter here, you know, and, and let's make sure that people that are giving this information, and it's not like what it is today with social media and everybody's a genius. They are medical genius. They are legal genius. They are po a political genius. I mean, not just a sports genius. They, they are across the board geniuses uh, with, with no background in any of it. Until you're the boss of something, you don't realize – you got to make that decision. It's not only for what's best for you or best for your company, also for the people that work for you. And and that's what I think we tried to do back then was to give a little bit of an outlet uh, at that point. And we had people calling in crazy stuff, and, and we, we would cut that off. Come on, you can't say stuff that you overheard. Unless you know it, then disregard it. Today, listen to your doctors and healthcare people that give you the right information. Stuff you read sometimes over the internet and social media is sometimes not correct, and many times. Mike, it's now not come correct. on, you trying to tell me everything I read on Facebook and Twitter is not always right? Um, do we want to <laughs> bet? <laughs> come on, <laughs> you get it. And sometimes I, I wonder about the comprehension issue that we have in this country. Man, listen, we could go a long time on that because sometimes you say something and people don't comprehend it. They hear it a different way. Bingo. You know, they, they hear it how they want to hear it. Come on, let's be smart now in, in what we're doing. And, it's, and it is a serious issue. And maybe we were a little too cavalier about it at first, okay? But now it's become that, you know, we got to pay a tremendous amount of attention. But listen to the health people. The doctors in this world, the people in the CDC that, that give you the information based on fact, not somebody who cuts grass for a living, and God bless them, you know, when you do that, not somebody who's working at a store, not a lawyer. Listen to the people in the medical profession that tell you that. And I've said to you this many times, we, we play in the toy store of life. We True. really do. Yeah. We, we, but you know what? The toy store is sometimes important because it does give people an outlet to hear different things that takes them away from the seriousness of life. And now to have this happen with Sean sort of brings it home a little bit. I, I can't tell you many people 
texted me or sent me a thing about, man, what is Coach O doing up there talking with John Bell Edwards? <laughs> he's owning well, like corona. I, he's 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 owning coronavirus, Mike. Man, he, you know, I see him. He's on Fox News. And all. <laughs> man, but my thing about it is, no, he's not claiming to be a medical expert. But what he's trying to do is to get a message across. Uh, you know, he's not going to tell you. You know, he's just trying to give you the message in his own way, okay? And it's not going to be long. Listen, you, you know, the one thing with, with Bebe, he's not going to go long with it. But right. he's trying to get it across to have you understand. But I, I don't see what's, what's wrong with that. Okay, my thing about it is when a politician gets up there to talk, how much does he know about the medical field? I don't know. Does he? Depend, <laughs> depends if it's like Bill Cassidy, who's actually a doctor. No, but no, I know your no, point. Bill's I, a different I know your story. point. I know your point. Yeah. B- Bill's a different story. But how many of those really know about it? All they're doing is parakeeting. They're just repeating what somebody tells them. And so, man, I've got about eight of them uh, about Coach O. My thing about it is, man, he ain't a medical provider. He's not, te- but he's just giving you the message. You You misunderstand it. Now, some of this is politically suede okay we all get that we we live in that world today uh that had he been up there with a different guy it would have been a totally di- we i'd have never got some of them text messages uh but again <laughs> it is what it is we live in that world but let's just be smart about it i think what happened with sean is going to happen to a lot of people in the sports world and in the football world and we just have to be precautious about what's going on and just take the advice and if you don't have to be out and about, and I, and I get it, you have to go to the pharmacy for medicine, you have to go to the store, uh, you know, for for food and 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 everything else that's involved in everyday living. Uh, but let's be smart about how we handle all this, you know, because we don't, you and I don't want to be talking about this three months from now. True. Yeah. Uh, Mike Dees, Malcolm Jenkins headed back to New Orleans. Reaction. I I know how much Sean liked him. And he has always made no uh, ifs, ands, and buts. It was the worst decision he's ever made to get rid of him um, when they did. Uh, I, I would maybe debate that, you know, that Darren Sproles decision wasn't real good either. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's in the neighborhood, put it to you that way. You, you know, Malcolm and everybody brings, talks about veteran leadership, and he does do that. But I think the biggest asset Malcolm Brinkin, Jenkins brings to the table is his ability to communicate. He's a chirper back there. And in this NFC South now, that now you've got to face Tom Brady twice a year. I mean, this ain't Jameis Winston. This is Tom Brady twice a year, Matt Ryan twice a year, now Teddy Bridgewater twice a year. And all the different looks and coverages you've seen, you need somebody back there that can communicate well. I think Sean in the offseason, and listen, I'm a big Von Vell fan. I really am. I think the mm-hmm. world of Von. I think he is sort of the intimidator. He's the tough guy in run support. Uh, he's created <laughs> turnovers, and he's sort of the guy in the middle. you got receivers sort of looking around. Uh, for where he's at, because man, he'll lay it to you pretty good. Um, coverage has been a little hit and miss with him, but he was getting better in that stage. I think that Sean wanted to get a veteran in there, a guy that could be that chirper, to be that communicator. You're not getting the 25-year-old Malcolm Jenkins. You're getting the 32-year-old. He has still played at a very high level, and I did – a couple of shows in Philly, and, man, people there, are oh, they raising sand. Uh, now, I don't say too much this morning because they got Slay, who I think is a really good player, too, mm-hmm. uh, from the uh, Lions, and just had to give up a third and a fifth to get him. But uh, I think uh, it makes a lot of sense in that once he became available, you sort of knew that if they could not come to terms with Vaughn, that he would be the alternative to that, and with so much today having a matchup against backs and tight ends is to find that safety that can do it because you're in nickel. Uh, I think Dennis Allen told us, I think he said it was 77% of the time. They are not in base. So you better have somebody mm. back there that can match up downfield. And uh, Malcolm still has gas left in the tank. He's smart. He understands what's going on. He understands the communication part of it. And I think that's the biggest thing he brings to the table. 
Yes, he's a veteran. Yes, he's going to bring leadership. It's his ability to communicate with the other guys. Doug Peterson told me this uh, last summer uh, when I got a chance to talk to him that he was like, man, Malcolm is so good at trying to get – because remember, they got ravaged by injuries in the secondary, and the Saints just torched them uh, that yep. game. Man, they, they, they were bringing people off the street. <laughs> and he said, man, what held us together was Malcolm. He said, you know, he was back there you know, teaching all these young guys what to do, where to be, and he said it was really difficult. If you remember that first playoff game, uh, remember that how the Eagles got in with the doink, you know, with the yep, Bears with in the Chicago. Bears. Man, the Saints win a dogfight that game against the Eagles in that playoff game before they got to play in the NFC Championship game. Man, the Eagles gave them everything they wanted in that. And they were—they didn't have Wentz at quarterback. It was Nick Foles. Uh, three of the four starters in the secondary were not there, and yet they hung with the Saints. Uh, so he brought up how much Malcolm meant to that football team, and uh, you know I think it's a good addition. I would love to see Von Bell back. I don't think that's most likely going to happen now, but uh, you could see where this was going with Sean with a lot of young pieces in the secondary, that he wanted to have that communicator. And that's what Malcolm brings to the table. He's on Twitter at Mike Dettillier. Uh There's a lot of other moves that have happened, Mike, including uh, Eli Apple heading out to Las Vegas. But the Saints haven't really made another big splash in free agency. Is, is Malcolm Jenkins it? Is this the, the big splash that they're making? Or do you anticipate they're going to add somebody else? I think one of the things they do every year, and I wrote about this two weeks ago, they make one big free agency hit right off the bat. Right. And then they let the market sort of calm down, and then they'll go after what they would consider middle-range guys. Once the market starts to settle, man, some of the money that is given out to some of these players today is unbelievable. Here's the biggest surprise to me. Andrus Pete. Yep. Because, you know, here was a guy, and I think the big question mark with Pete is his health. Uh, because when he's out on the field, he's a good football player. I don't care what anybody wants to try to convince me that Nick Easton's a better player than Andrews Pete. Come on. Uh, you, you, that's why they got a lot of eye doctors uh, in our area. <laughs> if, you, if you're going to try to convince me of that. Uh, but Andrews market is not as robust as he thought. Because I think you look back at it, it was a guy that went to the Pro Bowl, and he was an alternate, but still, he had a lot of people in this league that thought a lot of Pete, but would but question he missed so many games with injuries. And so if you're going to – availability is the number one thing. If I'm going to pay a guy a lot of money, I want him there. And Andrus has missed playing time with various injuries. And the fact that he could be a swing tackle if you needed it, I thought enhanced his value. Of all the free agent guys, that's the biggest surprise to me. But but I get it because of the injury factor with that. And I think they always will come back in the second wave and sign guys free agency-wise. One of the things that Mickey had brought up to us, I think in one of the final coaches' shows, was that now the balance is this. What do you do when you have a bunch of young players you've drafted and you want to keep them on that football team? And it's the balance of trying to keep as many of them as you can and yet still try to fill some needs in free agency. And that's a juggle of the ball today. And that, that's what's happening to the Saints. Their success in the draft, uh, I think, has transformed now of where do you go next? And I think the next probably big contract they give to someone is going to be Alvin Kamara. I, I, Sean is basically it's telling you without telling you uh, about how good he is, and I want him back on his football team, and you know, and he, I know he's in the final year. I mean, he's basically telling you that's who he wants. And you look at the running back market, and what's happened today yeah. with the release of Todd Gurley of a couple years back, this was a guy a lot of people were talking about possibly being an MVP in the league, but his knees. You know, you can tell that, that that's the big part of it. He, he, he's not the same player anymore. You got Melvin Gordon, who's a really good back out in Los Angeles. And Austin, the, 
Wilson sort of has kicked him to the side. You know, yeah. Two years ago, Matt, you would have never even dreamed of that, that these guys would be available at the right price. And you know what? I think the same sort of feeling is that in Carolina with Cam Newton, that you're going to come to a point similar to Gurley where there's no market for Cam in a trade, and you're going to have to cut him loose. Mike, let's talk about this this um, quarterback carousel. Uh, start at home, Drew Brees, we knew he was going to re-up. Um, briefly on, on the contract, the two-year $50 million contract? No, it's basically what, what he had signed you know, a couple years back and uh, gives you some kick-the-can moment uh, for the Saints. And, uh, man, Kai Harley, uh, he, he's the unsung hero with all this with the Saints behind the scenes. Uh, Kai, he, he's the money guy. And, and, in essence, he has set up a lot of these contracts. You know, Mickey approves it and takes a good look at it and everything. But, man, Kai is so good at doing this and being able to rearrange money around to open up things, to go out and get in free agency. And he is really – the, the kind of the star guy behind the scenes and what he does uh, with these contracts to open up areas where you can free up money to go out and get free agency. So, man, listen, Kai, if you're listening, God bless you, brother. You're doing, you're doing one hell of a job. Uh, and so I think we all sort of know that this is probably the it for Drew, uh, and, and he's going to play that last season. Uh, but it's it's a way to kind of kick that money can down the road and, and deal with it when you have to. Boy, you see just what's happening in, in L.A. with the Rams, with Gurley, and the financial situations there. And, you know, man, I don't know who set up those contracts, but you're talking about they have put a guy in a pinch. And that's what's happened with Sean McVay. He, he's really in a pinch now. And I think the next shoe to drop. And if I'm Saints fans, I keep a close eye on this. Okay. Brandon Cooks. Okay. Brandon Cooks. You know, one thing with Sean, he never holds a grudge against somebody. No matter what has happened, you know, uh, you know, if, if you can play, you can play. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised that if the price is right, that they would take a look in that direction mm. uh, for Cooks. He, he certainly would bring the feature that you're looking for as a speed guy that can blow the top off coverages. And uh, you know what he can do. You, you know him as well as anybody uh, in that he played here. And, you know, hey, listen, what, you know, you smoothed that over. Man, so many people wanted Jimmy Graham. Jimmy Graham, to me, is a sort of a football player. You've seen his best days, okay? And the Bears paid him a lot of money. Uh, to be, I, I'm surprised at the amount of money Jimmy got paid again uh, to play there. And, again, he, he didn't make it big with Russell Wilson. He didn't make it big with Aaron Rodgers. Uh, he's going to make it big with Trubisky and Foles. <laughs> Uh, good luck with that. Right. And so, but what? But watch what happens in LA with Brandon Cooks. I, I think he's an intriguing piece now uh, for some teams that feel as though they may have to just give up a middle round pick to get a starting wideout in the NFL. Okay. And he brings that speed element to the table. Mike, what we know also now is that we're going to get Drew Brees against Tom Brady twice a year. Uh, Give me a share a thought with me, if you would, Mike, on Tom Brady ending up in Tampa. You know, um, we've done this show so many times, and people have listened to me at other outlets. Back in the fall, um, and, and I couldn't tell the whole story, but you know, Tom and Giselle's photographer, that's always a Cajun somewhere mixed up <laughs> in the bunch. Yeah, they, and, I love how the story and, already and started. Then, and that personal photographer is a guy from Dulac, Louisiana. No, <laughs> no way. Yes, uh, so from Terrebonne <laughs> Parish. He's um, in his 40s. He, he still lives in Old Metairie. Uh, he lives in Old Metairie. Now, his family still lives in the, in the Terrebonne Parish area. But, um, you know, he first started working for Giselle and taking pictures. And then he became – they bring him around. And, you know, whatever vacation goes, he takes – uh, all these pictures that in videos that you see posted online that you know that's not Tom doing that you know that's not Giselle doing that come on <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, so man. he comes to a Saints game and you know we we doing the pregame out front and so you know I see him we go talk for a little while and he pulls me close to him and he tells me say listen this will be the last year of Brady I said he's retiring and he said nope in New England he winked at me and he walked away. I'm like, okay, uh, 
a couple of weeks later, we meet up uh, here on the bayou, and uh, he tells me, listen, uh, I, I don't think Tom's ever going to go back to New England. I think he would want to, but I, I think the issue may be it's like the Beatles with Lennon and McCarthy, you know, and, and Paul and, and John just not being able to get along. And it's almost like, you know, he, he wanted Bill to kind of have that, that moment with him that, hey, come on, man, you're just not a regular guy. You're just not a regular player here. That's just not Bill's way, though, about anybody. And I think when you have great success, um, sometimes there's a little bit of friction with that. And, and you see it sometimes in relationships with people who are in certain fields and or in the same fields. It becomes competitive between the two of them. Uh, <laughs> and I see it quite a bit sometimes. That it is a competitiveness there. And I think it is between Belichick and Brady. And I think it got to the point where I think Brady would have wanted to go back at one time. But Bill would not have that moment with him. Mm. Just wouldn't. And so Brady's deal was, okay, I'll have that moment. I'm off. Mm. And uh, so this was about a month ago, and you would figure. Uh, he calls me, and he's at the doggy show, Westminster Doggy Show uh, in New York. For, and he's taking pictures for Vanity Fair magazine. So, man, you talk about a rod from Dulac, Ma- <laughs> Louisiana. <laughs> and he's he's taking pictures for Vanity Fair magazine of the doggy show. And he said, man, Mike, the, uh, the real uh, divas here aren't the dogs. They're the dog owners. <laughs> <laughs> he, he said, you, you'd have to see it to believe it. And he, he told me up front. He said, I think it's over. He said, I think Tom's moving on. Then I asked him, where, where do you think he'll go? And he said, uh, he's not going to get out of the Eastern time zone. And basically, you know, he said, I don't know where he's going to end up, but he said, I think he ends up on the East coast because my feeling is, man, go to, go to Los Angeles. Right. Uh, that seems pretty good around you. And he said, no, he said, no matter what, he said that he's involved in the movie company business, but he said, I think he, he's going to stay on the East coast. Okay, and sure enough, he signs with the Bucks, and uh, he ends up with a guy who's – he was here with the Saints, and he coached under Jim Moore, and that's Bruce Arians. And you're talking about a character. Man, he is something else. Uh, he never was able to relay that to the audience when he was doing TV. He, he wasn't – for whatever reason, it didn't come out uh, with him, but he is a great storyteller. Man, he got – he coached the last two years. He was a running backs coach at Alabama under Bear Bryant. And, man, he got stories that are unbelievable uh, to tell about the Bear and, and how, kind of how it worked out. And he goes from there, he goes to Temple. And one of the quick stories he tells is that uh, he, he gets the job two weeks later. He's walking from his car to the facilities, and a guy comes up to him and robs him. And he says, you know, I had $38. He said, I had a 20, a 10, a 5, three ones. I, you know, I gave them to him, you know, and he said, you know, he looked like he had a pistol in his pocket. So he said, you know, I gave him my money. I wasn't going to argue with him. So he says about a week later, you know, that the school says, hey, listen, don't worry about it. We got security. Don't worry about it. He said, they, they ain't had no security. And he said, listen, it was sort of rough times in, in the Philly area. So mm-hmm. you had to want to kind of watch where you were. He said, man, I'm walking to the facility. Sure enough, he said, the same guy walks up to me and he's like coach i didn't realize it was you when i when i robbed you <laughs> and he said, reaches in his pocket and he gives him a 20 dollar but he said listen i spent the 18 other dollars but he said you the head coach at temple you're going to need this money a lot worse than i do <laughs> oh my god but bruce bruce says i've heard him talk, talk about people say he's the uh quarterback whisperer man bruce ain't never whispered in his life <laughs> he he's sort of loud in life to tell you things, and uh, but he has a great relationship with with his players, especially at that critical position. And he understood it that you know, listen, I we're gonna have fun here. And you know, his deal is, hey, if it if you itch, you scratch, right? Right. That's how his deal is. If it itch, you scratch. He's all about throwing the football. And so I think the relationship there is going to be pretty good. <laughs> they got some weapons there. <laughs> the one thing I would question is do you start to now build up up front along that offensive line? Tom's never been someone uh, to be mobile, uh, but, you know, you, you want to try to protect him. And defensively, uh, Todd Bowles is a good <laughs> defensive coordinator, and they're starting to build up there. 
So, uh, man, I just hate to see it because I've felt for the last 10 years, everybody tries to con me in the off season about how good the Bucks are going to be. Yeah. And to me, they're a pretender team, always have been uh, over the last 10 years. They've been pretenders. They're not contenders. And Brady puts them as a contender. They're going to be a good football team. You look at, man, the turnover machine Jameis Winston was, and now you bring in Brady. And, you know, they, they were playing pretty well at the end, uh, the Bucks were. And defensively, they've gotten better. And you're going to have, hopefully, Devin White for the entire season. Uh, with the Buccaneers, man, it makes this division a lot tougher. The Panthers don't want to tell you, but I'm going to break them the news for Panthers fans. Uh, it's the worst word you can use in sports. They rebuilding the the R word. Uh, they, they don't want to tell you that, but that's what's happening in Carolina. I think now the the team you sort of want to look in the mirror at is going to be Tampa, uh, just because I think Arians is a really good coach. They were a solid team a year ago. They can put points on the board, but the turnovers just were killers for them. And at critical times, Brady's not going to do that. And if they can get a little bit better on defense, they no longer pretenders. Yeah. I still think the Saints are the best team in the NFC South. They have better personnel. But I think Brady, instead of a seven-win team, can get them to a ten-win team in a playoff. All right, Mike D's with us. Final segment with Mike D. Let's get to your questions. Here we go. We'll start on Twitter. This is from at WhoDatTN. Ask Mike, should the Saints consider trading for tight end David Njoku? Well, I don't think the, the Browns are looking to get rid of him. Uh, just look at the coach there. You know, he was with the Vikings last year, and they used a ton of two tight end offense with Irv Smith Jr. and Kyle Rudolph. So I, I think even though they got Austin, uh, I think that they they want to keep a Joko. I think that so. I, I don't I don't look for the Browns to trade him. It's been part of what uh, what the coaches has, has really liked offensively, and he thinks he can get a big mismatch downfield with a Joko, who's like a big receiver. To be honest with you, Austin's a little bit different guy. He's a smart guy knows how to run good routes, but he's not the greatest athlete. The Joko's a different story, and so you know when you got Jarvis. And you got OBJ, and then you throw in Hooper and Adoku. Man, you got some talent there. Now, can you can you keep Baker upright? I think it's the big thing. So I don't look for the Browns to to deal him off. Ask Mike. This is Todd Dupree on Twitter. Ask Mike, which LSU player is the best chance of landing with the Saints? I think that would be Jefferson. Okay. You think Queen, uh, think you think Queen's would, off the board already? I, I think Queen will probably be off the board. Uh, the, the other guy, and this is just me now, but I, I've heard it a couple times, Sean talking about the value in his draft, and there's a lot of good players in, say, like the top 125. And I've heard him say it twice. You don't have a second-round pick. Uh, would this be a year, and he's never done it, but the deal down? And if that's the case, uh, then I think Christian Fulton comes into play here. Because I, I think that they're going to use an early draft choice on a young corner. Uh, you know, Jack Rabbit, you know, is up in age. And, you know, Robinson, you just restructured his, but he's no young guy neither. And so I think they would love to get a young corner in here. And so while well, everybody has talked about offense and the receivers, and if Jefferson's there, he, he would be difficult to pass. I think this team would, will look long and hard on the defensive side of the football, too and a possible trade down. Hmm. And if that's the case, then I think Christian Fulton could well be that guy. Ask Mike, do you think the Saints for linebacker go free agent or draft? Both. Hmm. I mean, you know, the, the Pickens is pretty slim uh, free agency-wise uh, at this point. But I think that they bring in a veteran, and I think they draft one. And, you know, a lot of people a few weeks back – I put Kenneth Murray yeah. going to the Saints from Oklahoma. And they were like, a linebacker, you got to go a receiver. I don't hear from him anymore. <laughs> that, that linebacker situation isn't as sturdy as you might think when you start to think about the injury issues with Kiko Alonso, with Alex Anzalone, Klein going to Buffalo. Uh, man, you got one stud in Demario Davis. But, man, there's a lot of ifs after that. Ask Mike, what are the chances the Bucks end up on HBO's Hard Knocks? 
I know one thing, that would have been the first call I make. Oh, <laughs> uh, man, I, man I, would, I would love that. Uh, again, uh, that's got to sort of be approved by the people with the Buccaneers. And, and, and you would really get to see Bruce Arians at his best doing that. But um, it would be an interesting show uh, if, if that did occur. But I want to say they were on a few years back. Mike, give me uh, – we've got, got a hard time, 60 seconds. Uh, the rest of the quarterbacks – I mean, we're talking Cam, Dalton, Flacco. I mean, you got uh, um, uh, you got a handful of guys that, that don't don't they don't have a spot. Who ends up where? Uh, a couple weeks back, we talked about it. Peter King wrote an article about Andy Dalton in New England. Peter King didn't pull that out of the sky. He got that from the man himself. Interesting. Okay. And so that's where I think now again, uh, sort of this is. You know, you're hearing the music almost stop for a few of them. Yeah. Of, of where are they going to land? One of those guys are going to end up with the L.A. Chargers. Uh, but I'm not sure which. I hate to say it, but it is true. Somebody's going to wait until somebody gets hurt in training camp, and then they'll sign that deal. 